Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear us? I can indeed. May we continue then with the evidence of Ms. Helliwell? Yes, of course. Good morning, Ms. Helliwell. Good morning. We looked yesterday afternoon at Council's advice in the Cleveleys case, which was dated the 26th of July 2004. Then, just before we adjourned, we looked at the note of a conference call with Council, attended by you, Mandy Talbot, Jan Holmes, and Keith Baines at which further evidence was discussed and a plan was made for the production of statements from Jan Holmes and Keith Baines. Yes. May we have, please, the, that note on screen, the references is WITN 04600310. And we can see here the date at the top left, and that's the 3rd of August 2004. So eight days after Council's advice was produced, and we can see about halfway down the page the trial date, which was the 16th to the 18th of August, so less than a fortnight away. Yes. My question for you yesterday, which prompted us to go to this document, related to the purpose of the further evidence which was obtained from Jan Holmes and Keith Baines, namely the statements of the 11th of August 2004. We know that Council had advised the Post Office to abandon its claim against Mrs. Wollstone for apparent losses in the sum of just over £25,000. Yes, yes. And the advice was also to admit Mrs. Wollstone claim of wrongful termination. That's right, isn't it? Yes, it is, yeah. He had advised, however, that there was an argument to be made on one part of Mrs. Wollstone counterclaim the claim that there was an implied term in the contract for services that the computer system provided for her use would be fit for purpose. Yes. And his view, set out at paragraphs 37 and 40 of that written advice, we needn't go back to them, we looked at them yesterday, but just in summary, was that it could be argued that any implied term should extend only as far as the obligation to take reasonable steps to provide a computer system that was fit for purpose. Is that a fair summary? Yes, it is. I'll say it is. Mm. That the fact that the system provided may have been defective on this occasion, to use his words, did not necessarily mean a breach of this implied term. And his, uh, his advice was that further evidence should be adduced on behalf of the post office that reasonable steps were indeed taken. Is that right? Yes. And it's against that backdrop, isn't it, that the discussion of further evidence at the conference was taking place? Yes, it was, yeah. Looking, please, to just above the trial date in this note, we see council's conclusion that first word is difficult to make out, but if goes to dispute, likely to find that computer system let JW down. Then under tricky position, a bit further down the page, we say she had difficulty operating and calls to HSH were part of dealing with problems beyond point of analyzing her system aiming to say that potentially implied terms to provide system that worked and system in place to support her. Over the page, please. Extra evidence that can be introduced to support this claim. So it appears, doesn't it, that the evidence to be obtained from Jan Holmes and Keith Baines was intended to address the, the reasonable steps to take, taken to ensure the computer was fit for purpose, the implied turn point. Yes, and the support given. Before we leave this document, can we look please towards the bottom of this page? The penultimate point here from KB, is that Keith Baines? Yes, I believe so. During acceptance, satisfied that if crashes happened, then transactions would not be lost. 
So this is what you were being told, isn't it, about the post office's understanding of the consequence of crashes for transactions at the point of acceptance? Yes, that's what we were being told, yes. That document can come down now. Thank you. Following this conference call, you assisted Jan Holmes and Keith Baines to produce those statements that we've just discussed. In relation to Jan Holmes's statement, the reference in your statement for the inquiry at paragraph 18 is in fact to a draft statement. We do now have the final version uh, and for the benefit of the transcript, that is WITN 090-20117. We need not display that document now. Keith Bain's second witness statement, dated the 11th of August 2004, is at poll 00118224. May we have this on screen, please? Can you recall now what the process was for the drafting of these statements from Jan Holmes and Keith Baines? Uh, in the case of Keith Baines, um, I would have had more involvement in the actual drafting, taking, but he, he would provide the information um, in a form that I would then adapt and put it in more of a witness statement form and obviously take further instructions from him on any points that I wasn't sure about or where I thought further information was required um, and I think as I said yesterday I base it on the information and documentation received from him um, it would be approved it would be then looked at by council and council would um, would have his, his input and um, deal with any queries or amendments following that can we look please apologies no, I was only going to say that I, I, I think the position with, with Jan Holmes would have been slightly different, which I can explain if you want me to. Please do. Um, I think, as I've said in my statement, obviously Fujitsu weren't our client, um, so my involvement with them was limited. I think looking at, at Jan Holmes' statement, he produced the very much the narrative of it because it was very factual and, and sort of detailed about the system itself um, and looking at the format of the of the um, of, of the text I probably put in more just the start of the statement and then the end of it and then he provided the body of it um, and obviously again the comments from myself council um, to deal with any amendments or any queries that we that we were looking at, that we had. Could we look please further down the page to starting at paragraph three in this second statement of Keith Baines. We see here the evidence the Horizon system was developed as a managed service by Fujitsu Services Limited, formerly ICL Pathway Limited, who also provided the actual equipment. Notwithstanding this, and as is the post office's usual practice in contracts for the development of complex IT services, the post office put in place a formal acceptance process to satisfy itself that the service was fit for purpose before allowing it to be widely deployed. The post office's required specification of the service provided by Fujitsu included requirements relating to the ease of use of the system, the stability of the system and the integrity of the financial information which it produces. The acceptance process of the system used a mixture of technical reviews, testing by Fujitsu in the post office and the operation of a live pilot stage in post office branches to confirm that each requirement was being met satisfactorily. I should state that this was not a rubber stamping exercise and that significant problems were found and remedied before the main rollout was authorised. Whilst there were some problems with system stability during the early stages of the acceptance process, these were rectified and a period of monitoring in pilot offices during October and no November 1999 demonstrated that the rectification had been effective in reducing the incidence of reboot and related problems to an average rate of less than four per counter position per annum. 
Subsequent improvements by Fujitsu during the year 2000 reduced this to less than three per counter position per annum. What were you told about the detail of the acceptance process being referred to here by Mr. Baines? Oh my goodness, it's, uh, again, it's 19, 20 years ago. Um, I can only assume that I was told what, what was uh, pretty much what was in his witness statement. Were you given any further detail beyond what is here? I just can't remember. I, I mean, I, to the best of my recollection, these were quite they were quite detailed and technical statements that really the information came from very much from the, the, the parties, the individuals who were providing the statements. I may have asked questions around that and got further information, but I just can't remember. We looked yesterday at Keith Baines's first witness statement. May we have that on screen again, please? It is poll 0011825. And looking, please, over the page to paragraph five of that statement. In this first statement in 2003, Mr. Bain said this, any faults that occurred in the Horizon computer system were eliminated once they were identified. Whilst it is possible for mistakes to occur, this is usually through incorrect inputting to the computer system in the office affected by the mistake. All sub-postmasters were fully trained in the use of Horizon equipment. The system was fully tested before it was used by the post office and it is fit for its purpose. The system itself does not create losses as is claimed by Mrs. Wollstonehome. There seems to be a difference, does there not, between what Mr. Baines is saying at paragraph six of his second statement that we've just looked at, that rectification had been effective in reducing the incidence of reboot and related problems, and what is said here at paragraph five in the first statement. Any faults that occurred in the Horizon computer system were eliminated once they were identified. At the time you were involved in drafting Mr. Baines' second statement, did you have any concerns that Mr. Baines had not been full and frank about the problems which had been experienced with the Horizon system in his first statement? Could I just have a look at his second statement again, the paragraph that you're referring to, please? Looking back, please, to poll 00011-8224. And over the page, please, to paragraph six. And we see here, uh, about three lines down, the rectification had been effective in reducing the incidence of reboot and related problems to an average rate. And we, we see those two rates provided there. Mm. I can only assume that at the time he was, obviously he believed the the statement in his first witness statement to be true. Can, can I just have a look at that sentence again, just so I can... In the, in the first statement? Yeah. That is poll 00118250. Over the page, please, to paragraph five. I mean, it's not hugely different because he's saying that the problems, that there were faults, but they were eliminated as opposed to rectified. I was referring really to the, the reduction reference to incidents, so reduction in incidents to three per counter position right. to annum. He may not, at that stage, we were, we were looking at it from a different perspective, and he was then asked to look into it in more detail. Um, so it, it may be that the further detail produced that information that he then provided in his second statement. When you were assisting Mr. Baines in drafting his second statement, 
did he tell you about any specific bugs, errors, and defects which had been identified in the Horizon system up to that point? Not that I can remember, no. That document can come down now, thank you. We know that this case did settle and that the post office made a payment to Mrs. Wollstonehome. Were any formal concessions made in the case before this settlement was achieved? This, this, is, this is the bit I can't, well, I really can't remember. Um, and I can't remember the terms on which the case was settled. Um, so I, I can't help you on that. Can you help us with whether the statements of Jan Holmes and Keith Baines dated the 11th of August 2004 were ever filed at court and served on Mrs. Wollstonehome? I, have, I can't recall, no. I mean, as I say, I, I, I can't recall. I, I, I've assumed that we perhaps settled it actually on the day when we, as the trial started, but I've, I've, I've got no specific recollection. And it may follow from your answer, your answers you've just given, but can you help us with what the final settlement figure was in the case? No. No, I, I, when I read through these papers, I do recall the £25,000 payment into court. So um, I do recall that that was made, but, and then obviously we, the post office would have had to have paid more uh, to settle it, but I can't remember what the terms were. The final document I would like to take you to, please, is poll 00095375. This is a letter from Keith Baines to Colin Lenton-Smith, dated the 5th of February 2004. If we can just scroll down a little so that we can see who it's from. Over the page, please. And this appears to be the letter which Colin Lenton Smith's Cleveley's letter and appendix, which we looked at yesterday, was responding to. There is one point in particular I would like to ask you about. The bottom paragraph on the first page, please. The county court instructed the parties jointly to commission a report from an expert approved by the court. I enclose a copy of his report. As you will see, the expert's opinion is that the horizon system installed at Cleveley's branch was defective and that the HSH was more concerned with closing calls than preventing recurrence of faults. As I'm sure you will understand, post office is concerned by these findings, not only in relation to this particular case, but also because of any precedent that this may set and that may be used by post office's agents to support claims that the Horizon system is causing errors in their branch accounts. Were you aware at the time of the post office, at the time of the post office's concern to avoid a precedent being set? that may be used by the post office's agents to support claims that the Horizon system is causing errors in their branch accounts. What's, what's the date of this letter again, sorry? This is the 5th of February, 2004. So this is just after Mr. Coyne's um, opinion was produced. I think at that stage, I was the only thing I was aware of was that the, the post office or the people I was dealing with were concerned by the findings um, of the report and concerns that the, the, um, Jason Coyne has reported on possible defects in the system um, because obviously they hadn't believed that to be the case. Um, at this stage, I don't think I was aware that they were, the post office were concerned about a precedent being set. That, that probably came, that, that came later. You say that came later. When, when later did you become aware of that? Um, well, I can say that I was specifically aware of it in the in the run up to the um, advice that we got from Stefan Lewinsky, because that prompted you know, that was one of the 
um, matters that prompted us to get the advice because of the difficulties in the case and possible consequences of the case um, of, of there being a finding against the post office. So I can certainly say in the run-up to obtaining that advice and then having had that advice and afterwards. And at the time, were you aware of any other cases involving the post office in which sub-postmasters were attributing apparent losses to the Horizon system? No, no, I wasn't. No, I wasn't aware of any cases, no. If there were such cases, would you have expected the post office to tell you about them? I would have expected them to, the post office to tell me that they had other ongoing cases um, in which, uh, yeah, in which alleged defects, defects with the system were, were being alleged. And would you have considered information relating to such cases to be disclosable material in the Cleveland's case? It would depend on the nature of the information. I'd have to see, I'd, ha I'd have to have a look at what information there was and then take a view on it from there. The losses alleged in this case by the post office totaled over £25,000. If the post office considered these were true losses rather than illusory ones, what was the post office's explanation or favoured explanation for the shortfall? Can you recall? I can't specifically recall. I know that there were um, there were suggestions about errors in inputting um, information and the management of the system, but I, I don't. I can't specifically recall. Did you? As un far as, sorry, as far as you were aware, hmm. uh, Mr. Hallowell, did the post office in any witness statement? seek to explain the losses it was alleging, i.e. to break down where the £25,000 had come from and how it could be that that had been lost? Not from memory. I... I, I, I mean, it's not there on the face no. of the statements we've seen. I was just wondering if you'd ever been party to a discussion where they might have been if you like, trying to work out what had happened? No, I, I don't recall being part of the discussion. All I can say is that I, I would assume that we'd have disclosed documents yeah, supporting well, those losses, but in terms of any discussion, I can't recall being a so, part. So this, is, this isn't um, being critical of you, but mm. if I were to draw the conclusion, if I need to, that basically what happened was Horizon said £25,000 was missing, so the post office just accepted it, and it was up to the uh, sub-postmaster to try and prove the opposite. Is that fair? I, I think that it would be fair to say that they, they would be asked to justify those losses and how they were calculated. Yeah, well, what, it may be that we just haven't got all the documents, so mm -hmm. I don't want to be uh, unfair in any way at all, but there seems to be a complete absence of focus on what happened to the £25,000 in this case. All that seems to have happened is that Horizon says there's a deficit in that amount, therefore there must be, therefore you, Mrs Wollstone, are more liable for it. I can see that that does that that is how it looks, but we've not seen the list of documents or the documents that were provided um, right. by the post office that could that could I'm not saying they would have supported how that how that loss um, was calculated and how it came about. Anyway, uh, this isn't a memory test for you. No, <laughs> <laughs> no it's so hard. <laughs> as the solicitor acting 
for the post office in this litigation, you don't actually remember seeing any documents which um, explain the losses. Is that fair? Yes, I don't. I mean, that's not saying that there wouldn't be, because I'm sure I would have asked for them, because we'd have to substantiate the, the, the losses and how they were claimed. Sir, um, it, for completeness, the amended particulars of claim, um, if we can have those on screen, please. That's poll 00118218. starting at the bottom of that page. Um, apologies, I need to give you a page number. Page 13 within the trial bundle. Looking towards the bottom of that page, please. Paragraph 5. The defendant's sub-postmaster's account shows an overall final loss in the sum of £25,034.04 in respect of the period up to and including 4th of December 2000. An itemised, over the page, breakdown of this figure is attached at pages 61 to 67. Such sum remains outstanding to date. So, sir, there is a document that um, shows some, uh, shows discrepancies, ultimately, yeah, in the accounts. Um what, what I was trying to get at, and perhaps you could help me, um, I'd forgotten about this, so thank you for reminding me, but is it any more than the Horizon record? Uh, no, sir, that, that, that's my understanding. The, the, the document for, um, for the reference is... starts at page 80 of that, um, using the external pagination of that document we've been looking at. All right, that, I'll look at that for myself, thank you. Yeah. And wh while I'm asking, um, the other question that came into my mind, Ms. Aliwell, mm. was um, relating to the questions that um, Ms. Price asked you about the differences in the wording between paragraphs five and six of Mr. Bain's two statements, all right? Yes. And I, I don't want to pursue the, the difference in wording with you, but especially in the second statement where he talks about um, <clears throat> there being a reduction as opposed to an elimination, it did strike me that that is information that could only have come from some kind of document. It's not very likely that Mr. Bain was carrying that around in his head. That's what I had in, in mind. Do you recall any documents being um, made available to you so that you could, could, so that you could disclose them in support of that witness statement? I don't specifically recall any documents, no. Because on the face of it, would you agree with me that if you're going to produce what would have been very late evidence, mm. uh, as in paragraph six, giving quite a, a, an important detail about a reduction in a problem, and documents exist, you would have expected that they would have been exhibited to the witness statement, wouldn't you? Yes, you would. Um... I guess, yes, and clearly would. that happened on any view of it. Pardon, sir. Sorry, sir. What did, what was that? On any view of it, that didn't happen. No, it did. No, no. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Miss Price, for uh, jumping in like that. Not at all. Thank you, sir. Did you understand there to be any desire on the part of the post office? to get to the bottom of what might have gone wrong at the Cleveleys branch?
not from the people that I dealt with or spoke to. Um, I think I've said in my witness statement, I've said in my evidence that the people I dealt with were shocked and concerned um, by the findings of Jason Coyne's report and information that seemed to be coming to light. Given the conclusions reached by Mr Coyne and the fairly stark advice received from counsel, did anyone within the post office or Fujitsu express concern that the Horizon system might be causing illusory losses in the accounts of sub-postmasters? I don't recall specific concerns being raised with me, apart from you know, the concerns I've already referred to. Um, I don't remember any other concerns raised about other accounts where that that may also you know, that may be attributable to the losses on those accounts as well. Did anyone suggest to you that there would be any form of investigation by the post office or Fujitsu to establish whether there was a basis for the suggestion that problems with the system might be causing apparent short, shortfalls in branch accounts? No, I don't recall that. You said yesterday, Ms. Helliwell, that you were shocked and concerned by Mr. Coyne's report. Did you discuss the content of the report with your supervising partner? I would have done because I had regular review my, uh, meetings, um, so cases were discussed at those meetings. Was there any consideration given by Waitman's? to what the wider implications of this report, Mr Coyne's report, was going beyond the Cleveleys case? No, because at, at that stage, as far as, as we were concerned, or possibly the post office, it could have just been isolated to that particular set of, of equipment, that system that was in use at that branch. Ms. Helliwell, thank you very much. Those are all the questions that I have. Um, sir, before turning to core participants, do you have any remaining questions for Ms. Helliwell? Oh, thank you. As I um, <laughs> said, I jumped in and asked them. So thanks very much. Thank you. I think there are some questions from the Hodge Jones and Allen team and the How and Co team. Um, starting uh, with the Hodge Jones and Allen team and Mr. Henry. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Ms. Halliwell, um, the fact that Mrs. Wolstenholm was, uh, a, lit uh, was a, a litigant in person, she was representing herself, um, did that uh, in any way uh, influence the instructions you were given by your client? No. She and had previously had solicitors as well, hadn't she? Sorry? She previously had solicitors and then she um, acted in person. Yes. Why, why do you think that was? I assume finance money. Yes, exactly. So financial um, pressure. Mm. Uh, did, did you or your client give any thought to the fact that she was a litigant in person? As a solicitor, you always give, have some regard to the fact that someone is a litigant in person and, and obviously deal with them accordingly, that they don't, they don't have the same knowledge of the legal system. Because I'm, I'm just, um, if we might have a look, please, at poll 001-1825. And I'd be very grateful if we could go to um, the internal um, pagination at page 208, please. And there we can see your letter, mm -hmm. which um, I obviously you must have an opportunity to read it to yourself. 
Yes. When you um, have confirmed that you've read it to yourself, uh, I'd like to take you to the response to your letter of the 29th of April, which is the following page, 209. Okay. And if we could therefore go to 209. Again, if you would be so kind as to just read that to yourself. Yes. I mean, did you consider that you might have to, given the fact that Mrs. Wilsonholm was a litigant in person, uh, explain um, the court orders to her so that she was in no doubt of the obligations upon her? We had been at a hearing and she'd been present and the the district judge had very clearly explained um, what, what was required, but um, do you, I, I do think you, then in my next in my next letter I may have clarified further about the uh, computer expert. I think from a, few, a further letter, um, and I think I simply send her the list of documents and the documents in another letter rather than her having to request copies. Yes. Um, you received instructions since you mentioned your further letter, if we could go to internal documentation to 111, please. Finally, as regards your request for the call log details to Horizon for the period from June 2000 to November 2000, our client does not have copies of these call log details and the only call log details in our client's possession are those referred to in item 10 of our client's list. Is that what you were told, that the post office did not have call log details to the help desk from the period 2000, June 2000 to November 2000? That's what I would have been told at the time. Um, and that's, so, that's why it was in that letter. Did you not question um, the apparent void in document retention and recording of information? I certainly would have done. What were you told? Well, as far as the call, these call log details, they were then actually produced, weren't they? So you were therefore at that point being given misinformation? It would appear so, um, because they were subsequently produced, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, we'll, we'll come back to that if necessary. Um, but but, but My letter was based on information. Your evidence here is that this was misinformation. This, this, the, uh, this letter, obviously, it's, this is based on the information I was receiving from the client. I see, thank you. Um, could I now turn to the issue of the single joint expert. And, and you were asked by uh, Learned Counsel to the inquiry whether the statements of Mr. Holmes and Mr. Baines were lodged with the court and you could not say. But you accept the principle, don't you, that with a single joint expert, as we can see the order of the county court, um, single joint expert, it's vitally important that they are only provided with completely accurate information. Yes. And that the information submitted to them must be scrupulously checked to ensure that the expert is not offering an opinion uh, on a false premise. Mm. You agree? Yes. Thank you. Um, when an adverse opinion such as 
that received from Mr. Coyne was received, and Fujitsu employees sought to rebut it. Um, did the post office recognize that Mr. Coyne's opinion was independent and unbiased? I can't specifically say that they did, but I, I, I certainly saw his opinion as being independent and, and unbiased. And, and I, would, I would have relayed that to the client. He was a, a joint expert um, that, that was instructed, and we had no reason to, to consider otherwise that it, um, that, that it would be other than unbiased. Hmm. Can you recall, notwithstanding the advice you believe you tendered to the post office, um, can you recall um, whether they accepted Mr. Coyne's opinion or not? Whether the post office accepted it? Yes. <laughs> it's just so hard to recall, but um, I can just more recall the concern and questioning um, of, of how you know of that opinion because it had come as a complete surprise and shock to them, um, and it's. Did they settle with good grace, or did they, in effect, very very shall we put it neutrally, reluctantly, settle this case? From the, certainly the people I dealt with, um, they settled with good grace. Ah. Um, uh, as opposed to, to it, it being reluctant, because they had to accept that the, the, the evidence. So, so it would follow, if they were settling it with good grace, that they would be um, persuaded of the merits of the unbiased and independent report, and would want, therefore, to disseminate the information as widely as possible, given the risk to other sub-postmasters, would it not? Could you just repeat that, please? Well, it would follow, if they were settling it with good grace, that they would be very concerned as to the content of the independent and unbiased expert report, and would want to disseminate uh, the information so that there should be no risk presented to other sub-postmasters. You would imagine that the only, the only qualification I would make is that this report was based on very limited information and documentation. Um, and, and, and who's responsible for that? Well, Fujitsu hmm. had, you know, the, 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 for, for whatever reason, the, um, the archiving provisions rules um, which obviously was, had been changed by this time. Um, but there was certainly a feeling that the experts' report could have been, could have, could have been different had mm. there been a full set of information available and data available. I mean... No, there was no, no, nobody knew that. Sh surely, I mean, it, it is obvious, uh, and I mean no disrespect to you in stating that it is obvious, that the post office did not want Mr. Coyne's findings to be widely known or even narrowly known by anyone other than those involved in that case. I would accept that, yes. Yes. And Learning Council to the inquiry asked you about the post office's concern to avoid publicity about Mr. Coyne's negative report, did they not? Yes. And you stated that uh, this was expressed at around the time of the conference with council, correct? Yes, it must have been the run-up to it and yes. around the time, yes. And we know that Mr. Baines was at that conference, don't we? Yes. And would it be right to say that Mr. Baines agreed that the post office should be seeking to avoid publicity? Mr. Baines, individually. Um, 
Yes. Yes, I, I can't recall that he, he did, that he specifically said that, but... Can we have a quick look? Um, no, I'm going to move on. Um, you, but he was the most senior person from the post office at that conference, wasn't he? Yes, Mandy Talbot was there, though, wasn't she? Yeah, but he was a very senior member of the post office at that conference, wasn't he? Yes. And um, you would agree that uh, around that time of that conference, um, they wanted to avoid, and they were very particular about this, publicity concerning Mr. Coyne's negative report. Yes. Right. Um, we know the fundamental issue was that Mr. Coyne had concluded that Horizon um, was at fault. Pursuant to my earlier question, when you said that the post office accepted that with good grace, do you accept now that the post office allowed themselves to become more concerned with suppressing that information than actually learning from it and addressing it? That's a difficult question for me to ask, to answer, because at the time of my involvement, they were concerned to avoid publicity. Um, but what they then did with that information moving forward and looking at other issues that I didn't know about, maybe that, um, that were ongoing with other postmasters, I wouldn't have been a party to that and how they... I realise this is very difficult for you because of the lapse of time. Mm. But of course you are relieved of your obligation. It wasn't your privilege, it's the client's privilege and it's been waived. You, you are relieved from the burden of legal professional privilege. Mm. Did you see it as any part of your job to warn the post office that it would be advisable to get to the bottom of this contentious issue rather than suppressing it? I would have certainly advised that this rep the report had to be taken very seriously and that questions needed to be asked. And surely they must have sought your counsel, your advice on this, because it went to the heart of whether Horizon was safe. I can't say whether they sought my advice on that. Um, uh, or but what, you know, what, what discussions we had, um, it's just so difficult to remember. But you do recall that you would have advised them to take it seriously? Yes. Yes. I would have... Uh, I mean, surely you're a commercial lawyer and a litigator. The reputational risk and the enormous damage to the post office must have featured in the considerations that centered upon this case. Yes, it, it would have featured, um, but again, at that time, we were looking at one isolated case. We didn't. I didn't know that there. Were, if there were other cases ongoing, sorry. At that at that point, I, we were looking at this one individual case. Whether there are other cases ongoing at that time about with issues with the system, I don't know. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, although the report was very concerning, it had to be looked at in the context of would it have been any different had all the data been available to Jason Coyne. He, his report was based on very limited information. Because of Fujitsu? 
Yes. So you have on the one hand an independent and impartial and unbiased expert, and on the other hand, you have Fujitsu disputing it, mm -hmm. but also, so it appears, withholding information. Correct? Well, I wouldn't say withholding information. The information had been, archived, had well, been deleted or destroyed after yeah. um, however long, 18 months. Yes. Well, deleted or destroyed. Did that not raise a red flag? That the information had, that it had been destroyed yeah. so soon? Well... Yes. Exactly. But also... And that, that, was, that had been changed already, hadn't yeah. it, to seven years or whatever, or six, six or seven years. Can I now move, please, to Elaine Tag? Yes. And um, could we please um, go to um, WITN 090... Two zero one one five, and this is um, Mr. Coyne's um, statement. And if we could be so kind to go to page two, and it's just underneath that more detailed examination, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, my observations consider the document. Uh, my observations considering the documents are as follows. And then, if we could, yes, thank you so much. The statement from Ms. Elaine Tagg, the retail network manager of the post office at paragraph 11, stated, Mrs. Wilsonholm persisted in telephoning the Horizon System help desk in relation to any problems which she had with the system generally. These problems related to the use and general operation of the system and were not technical problems relating to the system. And then Mr. Coyne opines, this, in my opinion, is not a true representation on the evidence that I have had access to of the 90 or so fault logs that I have reviewed. 63 of these are without doubt system-related failures. Only 13 could be considered as Mrs. Wilson's, as Mrs. Wilsonholm calling the wrong support help desk, requesting answers to how do I type training questions. And when you saw that, um, that must have been very troubling, mustn't it? Yes, because um, we would know that Mrs. That Elaine Tagg was, obviously she would be cross-examined on her witness statement and she'd have to deal with, um, with, with Mr. Coyne's opinion. Well, leaving aside her being cross-examined, what, what, what what about the submission of a witness mm. statement which is so manifestly wrong? In the opinion of the expert, it is wrong, yeah. It's. But uh, that's, that's why, having looked at... We, that's why we, um, we obtained the advice and from counsel on the evidence because statements like that were real cause for concern. It wasn't just the opinion of the expert that she was wrong. Even Jan Holmes said it would be hard to dispute that, didn't mm, he? Yes. Uh, and I, I don't need to take it, you to it. Thank you for your concession. But the reference uh, is FUJ 001-214-99 at page three. Could I just have a look at that, please? Of course, by, by all means. Yes. Do you see just the last line yeah, of that statement? Yes, I just wanted to see remind it? myself, yeah. yeah. You're, you're happy? Yes. Right. So, um, I mean, Mrs. Wilson's home brought this to your attention in her letter, 
which was received on the 2nd of February 2004. Um, did you, because she was suggesting actually that Elaine Tagg was, shall we put the euphemism, not telling the truth, did you discuss the implications of providing untruthful witness statements in legal proceedings with your client? Yes, I would have done. And what, what did you say? Again, it's hard to. It's it's hard to remember from so long ago. But I would certainly have highlighted um, uh, that as as a, a potential an error and um, potential misstatement in Ms. Tag's statement. Could I ask you now about Mr. Baines's direct involvement? We know um, that he was involved in the acceptance of Horizon and the many significant problems that still existed when it was rolled out, um, I suggest he was aware of. Um, when you go to the first witness statement of the late Mr. Baines, which is um, POL 00118250, and we go to paragraph five, and I want to make it clear, Ms. Helliwell, I'm not suggesting that you are a party to uh, any impropriety here, because of course you rely, don't you, on the information Oops. which you are provided with, Absolutely. don't you? Absolutely, yeah. Yes. But nearly every sentence in paragraph five of his witness statement, first witness statement, could have been contradicted, it would appear, from his own personal knowledge, from what we now know. You weren't aware of that at the time? Absolutely not, no. No. Um, and counsel to the inquiry took you to the handwritten notes of the conference that led to this statement being produced in which it seems that Mr. Bain said he would be candid about glitches. Do you remember that? I think so, yes. Yeah. Now, what I want to just try and help me with this, because uh, you said this morning to Learning Council, to the inquiry, that you believe that you would have had more involvement in the actual drafting of Mr. Baines's witness statements. I think you drew a distinction because Mr. Holmes was Fujitsu, Mr. Baines was post office, therefore you'd have had more involvement in the actual drafting of Mr. Baines's witness statements. That's what your belief was. Yes, and I, I think also I could tell from the, the typeface of Mr. Holmes's statement that it looked a different yeah, one it, at the start it, and then as if his information had pretty much been yeah. put in. Um, I'd have, <coughs> but then I do also, as with Mr. Baines's second statement, him and Mr. Holmes, I think as it's referred to in the notes of the conference and, and that they, they were working, yeah, they were exchanging information and working on um, their statements together as well. So they were a double act? They were both providing information and statements and I In think they were liaising yes. on that. Yeah. So they were, a, they, were a, they were working together, they were in tandem. And then, um, yeah. before it came to Before it, before came, to it came to you. Mm -hmm. That's precisely what I wanted to um, establish in fairness to you, lest it be thought that you were, you know, being uh, the active drafter. I wasn't on this. No, on you weren't. That, no. Because, uh, in fact, there is an email from Mr. Baines about his second witness statement copied to you in which he says that it was the detail behind the assertions uh, on paragraph five of um, his first witness statement. What I'm trying to suggest is that he drafted it without your assistance. Could we go to please pot POL 
3.3. And you see, there we are. I think this is copied to you, isn't it? Mm. Sent to Ms. Talbot, copied to Mr. Holmes, copied to you. Enclosed is a statement covering post office's approach to ensuring that Horizon was suitable for use uh, for, its, for, for its intended uses and users. I'm also copying this to Suzanne Helliwell. This in general, rather than specific to Cleveley's, and in effect is the detail behind some of the assertions in paragraph five of my earlier witness statement. As agreed, I haven't attempted to put this into the format required by the court. So in other words, and I mean no disrespect to you, but would it be the case that he drafted his second witness statement and you put it into the appropriate format? Yes, I would have put it into the appropriate format and asked any, you know, raise any questions or queries I had on yes. the information yes. he provided. Yes. And I sent it to council. Did he not, in fact, um, fax it to you as well? Do you recall that? Gosh, I can't. I can't remember well, a fax. Let, <laughs> let, let's have a look at. I'm sure. I'm sure if there's if there's a fax here, he did. Let's have a look at P O L zero zero one one eight two two four, please. So that's second witness statement. And could we go to? We, we know about paragraph six. I'm not going to take you to that again, but could we go to page eight, please? And we can see there that he sent it to you, didn't he? Yes, whether it was the... F <laughs> that was after you put it into the format and he, 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 he signed it. Is that right? Or? Do, do we know that this is the format that he... Is this him sending me his his initial statement, th or is it because that just... that was attached to the email? Yes, this that was this, this to, to me email, would be it? more that he signed it, and he and faxed it back to me because I'd need a signed. At that at that time, I don't think we really did. It doesn't appear. Yes, it, it was, it was signed. So this is. So after this is you after. Formatted this it. is probably after. Yeah, you formatted it. You formatted it by this time. And he faxes it back. So perhaps that's not so important. I think but, it's. I think but the first one would be. shows. Oh, the answer to what? So uh, this, this, this would have been. Um, I, I assume that this would be him faxing his signed statement back to me. Yes, but I can't but be certain. But that's what I assume. Initially. It looks like he drafted this statement without your assistance, doesn't it? Yes, and it, his, it, was, it was attached to that email that you just showed me that he sent to Mandy Talbot. And you don't recall making any alterations to it? I mean, how could you? I can't, I just, I can't recall. No. No. Um, could I, in conclusion, um, in his second witness statement, he admits to significant problems at acceptance, touches on the subject of blue screens, but he completely ignores the acceptance incident which centered upon unreliable cash accounts, doesn't he? Pardon, um, you'd have to just take me to Within that. his second statement, he doesn't mention anything to do with unreliable cash accounts. Um, he doesn't deal with a very critical acceptance incident which centered upon unreliable cash accounts. Y you, of course, unless you're told about serious acceptance incidents, you can't be presumed I can't, I can't be to, presumed to know. No. You can't say, well, why haven't you mentioned this? No. So you were very much dependent, weren't you, on the information that was provided to you? 
Yes, absolutely. And, he, and they, him and Jan Holmes were providing statements dealing purely with the matters that we discussed yes. in conference and um, to do with the, the point that was raised by Mr Lewinsky and his advice on evidence and quantum on the implied term issue. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Sorry. Um, and can some, we... Mr. Jacobs has some uh, questions, sir. Did you want to proceed, or did you? Did you? It depends uh, a little on how long Mr. Jacobs will be. I think I can encourage Mr. Jacobs to um, conclude his questions before a break, I think. Let me put it that way, Mr. Jacobs. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll endeavour to be quick. Um, I Act for um, 157 sub-postmasters instructed by Howe Co. And um, I want to ask you about a specific point. Um, many of my clients, if not all of them, feel that um, post offices' attempts in 2004 to suppress uh, Jason Coyne's expert evidence and keep it out of the public domain amounted to a cover-up of the failings in the Horizon system. So I want to ask you about that. Um, you said um, in your um, answers this morning to Ms. Price mm. that you became specifically aware that the post office were worried about a precedent being set in the run-up to receiving council's advice. Is that right? Yes. Um, and I would have been because that, uh, that's probably one of the reasons that had prompted me. I, I do actually refer to getting to his advice after we received the report, but I know that over time I would have... Yeah, prompted. And you dealt with Mr. Concerned. Keith Baines quite a lot, didn't you, in your dealings with the post office in that um, case? More, f more from the purposes of witness uh, evidence, my main point of contact was Jim Cruz and then Mandy Talbot. But you took instructions from Mr. Baines in relation to his first witness statement? For his statements, yes, but in the general running of the case, it would be the legal team. In relation to the precedent being set point, can I refer you to a document, um, POL 00095375? Now, this, we'll, we'll wait for it to come up on the screen. So, this is a letter from Keith Baines to Colin Lenton Smith at Fujitsu, dated the 5th of February 2004. And he says, if we could perhaps scroll down to um, the paragraph where it begins, as you will see. So, yes, if we uh, go up again, I'm sorry, um, to the last paragraph on page one. So it says, um, as, as you will see, so uh, um, the expert's opinion is that the Horizon system installed at the Cleveland branch um, was defective and that the HSH was more concerned with closing calls than preventing recurrence of faults. Now, you've heard from Mr. Coyne yesterday about that. As I'm sure um, can be understood, the post office is concerned by these findings, not only in relation to this particular case, but also because of any precedent that this may set, and, and the important bit is this, and that may be used by post offices, scrolling down, um, agents to support claims that the Horizon system is causing errors in their branch accounts. Now, what I want to ask you is, do you um, accept from um, having post office as your client that the precedent issue they were worried about was that other sub-postmasters would latch on to the fact that post office knew and was aware and their own expert had told them that the horizon system had deficiencies? Yes, if, if, they had a, if they had issues with other agents, I wasn't aware that they had issues with other, other agents concerning accounts. I, and also, I'm not actually sure that I would have been no. received a copy of that letter no, at that time. Um, but you said in your evidence that you were aware that post office were concerned yes. that Jason Coyne's report would set a precedent. And what I'm putting to mm. you is, that um, the reason 
for that precedent concern mm. was that post office didn't want other sub postmasters to get wind of the fact that post office's own expert has said that there were deficiencies in the horizon system. Yes, and at that time, it may not have been that there were any, as I say, I wasn't aware of any other issues, um, but they wouldn't want that to be set, um, the precedent to be set for any future issues should they arise. So is it fair to say, and you may or may not be able to answer this question, of course, that post office were, from what you observed, um, involved in covering up horizon deficiencies from sub-postmasters from 2004? I can't say, I, I can't say that I, I was involved. But that was their precedent concern, wasn't it? It wasn't a, a matter of covering up. Um, and Mrs. Wollstone-Home could be very, obviously she was entitled to be very vocal and tell anybody about this particular, the, the county court proceedings. So um, she could have told anybody about the findings of the report anyway. Um, all I know is that they were, they were concerned about adverse publicity and wouldn't wish um, for that to go against them in, you know, in terms of any future potential claims. In any future cases? Yes, but that not, not that they were aware or I was aware of any okay. at that time. Um, I think I also mentioned before as well that certainly the people that I dealt with, um, a view, you know, one view was that this report was based on just a very, very limited amount of, of, um, of documentation and that for all we knew, the, the outcome of a, such a report could have been different had he had access to all the data. But that's just that was that was possibly something that I I got the impression from the legal team. Did you um, hear Mr. Coyne give evidence yesterday? No, I didn't know. Um, you said that one view was that his report was um, limited because of he was because of him being given given lim limited mm. information. Yes. But do you accept that there is another view? which happens also to be Mr. Coyne's view, that it was a perfectly valid report. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's, yeah, based, yeah, it was a valid report based on the information he had. Can I um, go to, and I apologise for t showing this one more time, <laughs> um, Mr. Bain's first witness statement, paragraph five. Right. And I will be very quick on this point. POL 0095374. We probably will know this by heart now. <laughs> Just waiting for it to come on the screen. Here we are. So get to paragraph five, please. Now, you'd obviously read Mr. Coyne's report at the time that this was drafted. Um, were you concerned that what Mr. Baines was saying um, at paragraph five wasn't actually true? What was the date of this statement? Now, I'm afraid I'm not able to help you with that. No. Oh. Can, can you go back to the, to the top? Let's go back the to the first. top, shall we, please? Again, it doesn't assist us. Right. But in, in can I just check, though, that weren't the first set of witness statements served before Mr. Mr. Um, Mr. Coyne's report, I can't Well, if remember. that's the case, then, then that's the case. I don't know, I, yeah. But I reckon is that this statement is the autumn of 2003. That's what I thought, so, Thank yes. You, sir. Um, so he'd have actually done this without the benefit, you know, without having sight of Mr. Coyne's report. But w uh, were you concerned that um, the account that Mr. Baines was giving um, was in that statement, did, um, were you later concerned that um, that couldn't be borne out after uh, Mr. Coyne's expert report came out? I would have been because, again, that would have prompted the, even more so the need to get counsel's advice on the evidence because I had our statements, I had Mr. Coyne's report and it's how our witnesses could deal with those statements in the context of, 
of the report from Jason Coyne. You um, have said that you discussed these matters with your supervising partner. Mm. What was his name? Was that Neil Kelly, who you mentioned before? Um, this, this is the, this is, this is probably what I struggle to remember because at the time, um, he was my supervising partner. Um, but then we also had um, a partner who was responsible for that particular client post office, and that could have been David Jacks, who's referred to earlier on. So I, I don't, you know, I, I, I may have discussed it with both of them. So either or both of David mm. Jacks or Neil Kelly. And um, did um, Waitman's act for post office in other cases that were ongoing against sub postmasters? My understanding at the time was that they acted more on the employment claims, right. um, but they, they would have done, obviously, they, this is a litigation matter, commercial litigation matter, so they, they, they would have um, had some dealings, but then, as you saw, the proceedings were started by consigned by the in-house team, and that may be what had happened. That, maybe that, that was what happened on the commercial litigation side initially, in, and did Waitman's view post office as a particularly big client or an important client? At the time they were, but I, I remember more specifically on the employment side and uh, more, more, more than anything, but that, that's just my recollection at the time. Do you think that uh, Jason Coyne's report is something that would have been disclosable in any future proceedings in which your firm had, had, acted, against post had acted for post office against sub-postmasters? I'm going to stop you there, because so many possible permutations that that's almost an impossible question. Very well, yes, I, I, I'll, um, question to answer that. I'll withdraw that mm. um, question. So um, I don't have any further questions to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. And uh, thank you, Ms. Helliwell, uh, for uh, your evidence to the inquiry and your witness statement and your forbearance in coming back this morning as opposed to finishing your evidence yesterday afternoon. I'm Thank grateful you, sir. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Right. So we'll take our morning break. Yes, Ms. Price? Yes, sir. Mr. Beer will be asking questions of Mr. Lenton-Smith uh, next. So if we could take a 10-minute break, I think that takes us to half past. I, I think we'll have 15 minutes, if you don't mind. Um, of course. OK. 25 to 25 to you, sir. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, may I call Colin Lenton Smith, please? Of course. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, shall be the, truth, the, whole truth the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Uh, good morning, Mr. Lenton Smith. My name is Jason Beer, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Can you give us your full name, please? Yes, it's Colin Edward Lenton Smith. Uh, thank you uh, very much for coming to uh, give evidence to the inquiry today and in assisting us in our investigation. And thank you also for previously providing a witness statement. Can you open that witness statement, please? I think it's the first tab in the binder in front of you. Yes. It's dated the 22nd of May, 2023. And if you turn to page 14, is there a signature? There is a signature. And is it yours? It's my signature. Yeah. And are the contents of that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are, yes. For the transcript, the URN is WITN 08590100. No need to display that. I'm going to ask you some questions this morning and this afternoon, Mr. Lenton Smith, principally about your role in the claim brought by um, Mrs. Julie Wollstoneholm, who ran the Cleveland Post Office in Lancashire but also some broader issues about the provision of litigation support by Fujitsu and in, in its predecessor guise as ICL Pathway Limited um, to the post office. Yes. 
can I start with your background, please? You tell us in your witness statement that you qualified as a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants and worked in industry from 1979, is that right? That's correct, yes. If you just move forward a little bit, the microphones will pick you up a bit better, that's it. Thank you. It, you joined um, ICL um, Computers, or ICL, um, in 1990 as a commercial manager within the international division, is that right? That's correct, yes. And was that preceded by some work in the IT industry from about 1985? Yes, I had worked for um, the computer company Wang at the, uh, for four or five years previously before joining ICL. You tell us um, that you worked for ICL Pathway Limited from March 2001, is that right? That's right, yes. Before then, had you had any involvement in... Um, uh, the project which became known as Horizon? No, none at all. Um, and at that time, March 2001, you joined ICL Pathway Limited as the commercial and finance director. Yes, this was not a, it wasn't a registered directorship in terms of uh, registering a company's house, but it was a, a position given the seniority of the, um, the function, so it was leading the function of the commercial and the, and the finance functions. Did you take over um, in that position um, from Anthony Oppenheim? Uh, in that functional role, yes, but not as a director of Pathway. He was a director of Pathway, I think. I believe so. Um, did you stay in that role as director until October 2007? I did, yes. Well, it would change. The role changed from being a finance and commercial um, responsibility to simply commercial what did you do after October 2007? I then worked for another uh, multinational contract uh, that Fujitsu had taken with uh, uh, an international company to manage that contract. And until your retirement in, I think, September 2018, yes. um, did you have any further involvement with the Horizon programme? None at all. So we're principally interested in the period March 2001 until October 2007. Right. About six and a half years. Yes, that's correct. If you can turn up uh, your witness statement, please, um, WITN 0590100, and um, look, please, on page two. At the bottom of the page, paragraph five. You say yes. regarding um, Post Office Limited legal action against sub-postmasters, as part of the service for Horizon, Fujitsu provided support to the Post Office as and when required in the form of audit data, witness statements, and if required, appearances in court. Outside of the standard service, the Post Office may request Fujitsu to provide um, special assistance. So you say here that Fujitsu uh, provided support in the form of audit data, witness statements, and court appearances to support legal action against sub-postmasters. Was it your understanding that that was part of the contract between the post office and Fujitsu that required, in general terms, without looking at the specific um, three elements you described there, litigation support, to um, the post office? Within numeric constraints. So I believe, uh, just as I started, um, a number of audit requests were made available, a negotiated position uh, that, that Fujitsu then, or ICL Pathway then pr provided um, to post office. I think it was 50 at around, the, around that time. What's about anything more fundamental than, the, than that? So rather than the um, number per month or year of um, um, packets of audit data, anything more fundamental in the contract? Was it your understanding um, that the contract contained any such provisions? Um, I think that was, there was a letter from Martin Bennett to... Uh, post office, which I believe there was an agreement reached on uh, limiting um, a general statement on provision of data, provision of um, information to, the, to these number of requests, but I can't recall whether there's anything wider than that. 
Okay. If we just go up um, the page to paragraph four, you say, as the com um, commercial director, my role involved managing an autonomous finance team and a small commercial team uh, to contract manage the horizon contract with the post office and to execute contract changes for some things yes yes sir. that's right and so was your job um essentially managing the contract it was managing the contract yes well it was managing the contract from a commercial perspective so that my opposite number in the post office keith baines um we would have discussions about points of the contract um, and these would be discussed or issues that were raised would be discussed through commercial forum um, monthly I believe but, but periodically um, to, ish, to deal with the issues that arose from the contract. And so at the time you would have been very familiar with the terms of the contract between the post office and Fujitsu? Yes. Can we look at, I think, the, um, uh, the letter to which you were referring? Um, Fujitsu 0015 Fujitsu 0015 5527. Just forgive us a moment. Thank you. Um, this is um, indeed a letter to um, Charles Layton from um, um, Martin Bennett. Uh, if we just look at um, the letter generally to start with and look at the foot of the second page. Thank you. You'll see that it's um, written by Martin Bennett, the quality director um, within um, ICL, and then go back to the first page. It's written to Charles Layton, the internal crime manager in post office, and it's dated the 6th of February 2001. We'll see in a moment that this concerns um, uh, contractual provisions, and most specifically, the post office's need to have Fujitsu staff produce witness statements for the purposes of legal proceedings. So this is dated February 2001. That's about a month before you took up position. Is that right? That's right. Um, and is that an issue with which you became familiar when you took up um, your post? I find it, I find it difficult to remember that I have to specifically. Um, working backwards from the fact that we had contracted for a number of audit requests and that was an ongoing discussion with post office commercial in terms of providing more increasing the number um, there are in the minutes of the commercial forum later on um, there are points about increasing the dwp support um, for um, support litigation support so I think it was an ongoing position that we started at 50, which I think is what this letter, and I think Keith Baines, is one of his submissions re refers to as 50, but I think they increased over time. I can't remember specifically the numbers that we got to, but it was a topic for discussion. Um, th this is about um, witness statements, witness statements in, in, yes. in particular, rather than the provision of audit data. Yeah. Um, was that an issue with which you became involved? when you took up post a month after this letter was written? Uh, not specifically, no. 
who um, we, we saw that Mr. Bennett was described as the quality uh, director at ICL. Was he a person who you knew within ICL? No, he had left. He left almost immediately um, after I joined. And what, what was the role of quality director? What does that mean? Well, it wasn't. A fu it's not a function that I recognise existing at the time. Um, I, I can recall that maybe that was passed over to uh, other functions, um, such as the audit manager. Um, but I'm not sure there was a specific quality director during my time there. So he wasn't a part of your team, Mr. Bennett? Not part of my team, no. Um, not part of the commercial team. Not part of the commercial team. He was not part of the commercial team? No. Was he working in the same office as you? Uh, he may have been based in Feltham, which is where we were based, but I don't... That's what the letterhead suggests. Yeah, but I don't recall him... Uh, I, I think he must have left that position around that, around March, because I just can't recall his being around at the time. And if we look at the foot of the... Um, Second page, please. We'll see um, to whom the letter was copied, and we'll see that it was copied to Tony Oppenheim, your immediate predecessor. Yes. Uh, presumably you re received some sort of handover from Mr. Oppenheim. Uh, yes, I did. And would that include passing over um, of files? There would have been correspondence handing, handed over, yes. And so we can assume that this would you will have no come. specific memory, but this is the kind of thing that would be handed over. Yeah, I mean, if there's, if there's a copy of this letter, a hard copy of this letter um, on file within the commercial library of information, then I, I would have had that copy. Thank you. Can we go back to um, the first page, please? I'm going to spend a little time on the letter, okay. um, if I may, because this is a new document to the inquiry um, received relatively recently. Um, and I'm going to, therefore, given the importance of the issue, look at it um, carefully. Uh, you'll see the heading is witness statement request. Um, and Mr. Bennett says, I'm writing to respond to the exchange of emails between um, yourself and Graham Hooper recently, read your request for the provision of witness statements. Can you recall um, who Graham Hooper was? Yes, I do, yeah. And um, what's your recollection of the function that he performed? Um, he worked with Jan Holmes um, in the, in the uh, audit area, uh, which included the provision of witness statements. Um, some of the documents um, have got him signed off, including in an email signature block, as a security manager within the security team okay. at ICL. Um, I can't Does that jog your memory? Uh, um, you've jogged my memory. I didn't remember offhand what it was, um, but I think uh, yeah, clearly that was his role. Was he someone that you dealt with on occasion? On occasion, given your deal, yes. I.e., when an issue over the contract arose that concerned the function that he was performing. Yes. So, if there was material to be gained to be um, put together uh, in response to a commercial issue that the commercial department in post office would have raised, then in formulating the response, um, he might have been part of that, uh, bringing that together, the information that we then responded back to post office with. So this is Mr. Bennett, the quality director, writing to the internal crime manager in the post office, saying, you've exchanged some emails between a security manager within us, yep. ICL. Yeah. Um, and he says, I believe the, that the relevant uh, provision is requirement um, um, 829, part one, which states, quote, the contractor shall ensure that all relevant information produced by the POCL service infrastructure at the request of POCL shall be evidentially admissible and capable of certification in accordance with the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, PACE 1984 the Police and Criminal Evidence um, Northern Ireland Order 1989 and equivalent legislation covering Scotland. So this mentions the relevant requirement in the contract. Yes. 
Uh, my concern, he says in the fourth paragraph, is that Pockle sees this uh, requirement as an open-ended obligation on Pathway to produce information-related witness statements at Pockle's request. This is not how we see it. The requirement is that relevant information produced by the Horizon system at Pockle's request be admissible evidence in court, which so far as such information in itself can be, it is, and capable of certification in accordance with PACE um, or equivalent in Northern Ireland and Scotland. As you're no doubt aware, the relevant sections of PACE, section 69 and 70, were repealed by the Youth, Justice and Criminal Evidence Act 1989, which came into force on the 14th of April 2000. And so having um, cited the relevant provision of the codified agreement, I think he's citing from version three of the codified agreement there, he sets out ICL's interpretation of the provision which is that um, relevant information produced by Horizon should be um, admissible evidence in court and capable of certification. Do you recall um, that being ICL's interpretation of the relevant part of the contract? No, uh, not when this was written because it was before I started. Did you discuss um, this issue with Tony Oppenheim when he left or as part of the handover? Not that I recall. Did you ever have cause to look at this part of the um, contract in the coming um, months and years? Not that I recall. Uh, let's carry on in substantive paragraph five. We've made our position with respect to requirement 829 clear on a number of occasions. However, given that you seem surprised by the stance taken by Graham Hooper, it may be of assistance if I set out some of the background. The issue of witness statements was discussed in meetings between Barry Proctor, then our security manager. Do you remember Barry Proctor? No, I don't. Uh, Bob Martin, recall him? No. And Paul Harvey, remember him? No. In July 1989, it was made clear in those meetings that Pathway did not consider the production of witness statements to be included in the scope of the requirement. An acceptance incident, 370, was raised by Pockle, Bob Booth, on the 23rd of July 1999, and a clearance action for this incident was agreed as follows. Can you recall what acceptance incidents were? Um, I think these were incidents that were raised during the acceptance process of the Horizon software. Uh, do you recall anything more about what an acceptance an incident in AI was? No. In any event, the AI stated as follows, was agreed as follows, quote, pathway will provide pace statements as necessary to support a fraud prosecution. Pathway will update the work required to produce draft witness statements when Pockle have raised an appropriate change request, as indicated in the letter from Barry Proctor to Paul Harvey, dated 8th of July, 1999. The reason why this is necessary is because Pathway has no contractual obligation to provide Pockle with any evidence to support a prosecution. So these are all events that predated your time in your position, yes? Yes. yes. Uh, did you know that the post office was su uh, supposed to produce a change notice to make provision for the production of witness statements? Well, that would have been a natural um, change to the contract. So any change to the contract would have gone through, a, through the change control process. And if the post office wanted to um, provide for that or request that, then they would have issued this change request, which would have gone through uh, impacting an assessment and come to a commercial, a commercial arrangement, and that would then have been included in, um, in, drafted into the contract as a change. And so what this is saying is that an, an acceptance incident was raised with agreed wording, and amongst that, it was agreed that because the contract includes no obligation to provide the post office with any evidence to support a prosecution, 
it's necessary for the post office to raise a change to the contract through yes. a change notice. Yes, exactly. Uh, the letter continues, the statutory requirement for pay statements and certification no longer exists as above. Pockle has never submitted the required change notice, hence my negative response to your request to Graham Hooper for draft witness statements. When you joined um, a month after this letter was written, did you know that the post office was supposed to have produced a change notice, i.e. tabling a change to the contract, but that it had failed to do so? Um, not specifically. I, I can only um, surmise that it eventually did happen because the issue of witness statements became a, uh, a change to the contract. So, that, so this point I was talking about, the limit of 50, would have been dealt with through a change request. So That's a separate issue, the provision of audit data. We're at the moment looking yeah, at right. yes. um, the provision of witness statements. I, again, um, I can't specifically re recall the change but I, can, I believe that that would have happened in order to come to an agreement that we would produce, or the Fujitsu would produce witness statements, however number they were, however, however number they're going to be, um, that would have been dealt with through a change request. So any change to the contract would have been done through a change control, through a change request, and then a, a, a change to the contract. In the answer before last, you said I would surmise that. Do, well, I, I surmise it in the fact that I wasn't around when this was... The fact that they had... Uh, you're suggesting that they hadn't produced it, or well, this letter says they hadn't produced it. I wasn't aware that they hadn't produced it. And all I can suggest is that because we were doing it later, that, that a change request would then had subsequently been issued that we would have then impacted and then brought into the contract. OK, well, th we'll look at the rest of the letter to see whether that follows at all, because okay. what we'll see is that there's a without prejudice agreement to produce witness statements. Um, we, I, I don't think we've got a change notice in any of the disclosure that we've got. Really? OK. Y you're essentially putting two and two together and saying that they equal four because we must have had a change notice because we produce witness statements. That's what I'm saying, yes. That's not doesn't necessarily follow, but no. it's, it's kind of a logical path. OK. The letter continues. Um, in answer to your query as to what change should be requested, the change request would either be for a particular statement required by Pockle or, which would appear the more sensible option, to change requirement 829 such that it incorporates a more general obligation to produce witness statements any such change request will be subject to impact assessment and costing in the usual way. And so what this is saying is because there's a change to the contract here, we'll have to assess its impact and work out how much we're going to charge you for it. Yes. Uh, Mr. Bennett continues, as things happened, AI370 was not closed on the basis of the clearance action referred to above. It was closed in, instead without concession by Pathway on the basis of agreement between Pockle and Pathway concerning access to audit information. The background to the audit information agreement, as you're probably aware, is that during the first few months of 2000, there was discussion and correspondence about the requirement to produce audit information to support investigations. This culminated in agreement in principle being reached at a meeting on the 29th of March 2000 that Pathway would provide up to 50 audit data extractions per annum for audit and security investigation purposes with a maximum of seven in any calendar month. The basis of the agreement was described in more detail in my letter of the 24th of May to Keith Baines and confirmed subsequently in connection with closure of AI 370 in September 2000 and he provided the documents. Pathway has been providing access to audit information in accordance with the agreed limits and other matters set out in that letter, in relation to which, by where further confirmation of the agreed path, uh, arrangement, Pathway will raise a change notice. So what he's saying here is that although the AI 
was concerned with um, uh, dr the production of draft witness statements, it was actually closed off by a different agreement relating to the provision of audit data. Yes. And therefore, the witness statement issue remained outstanding. Yes. He continues in the last paragraph, I trust that the above makes Pathways contractual position clear in accordance with your email to Graham Hooper of the 10th of January, stating that you would, quote, uh, be happy to agree to accept the cost to produce the statements on a without prejudice subject to contract basis at this time, pending the outcome of commercial discussions. Pathway is willing to provide witness statements. How I emphasize, however, I emphasize that this is without prejudice to the above position, and Pathway does not accept that it's contractually obliged to do so. Were you aware of that without prejudice agreement when you took over a month after this letter was written? Uh, I can't remember that specific detail. Over the next six and a half years, were you aware of any change in the contract, whether raised by a change notice or otherwise, that made specific provision for um, the production of witness statements? Uh, my, my memory is not good enough to remember specific details about the witness statements. I understand. So let's um, move on, please, um, and see what happened. Uh, can we look, please, at Fujitsu 00121788? And if we just scroll down just a little bit further, we can see this is um, a letter from the um, uh, Mr. Hooper, the security manager, um, dated the 8th of September. If we just scroll up a little bit, please. 2001, so when you're in post. Yep. To um, Mr. Layton, the internal crime manager, about the Higher Broughton post office, um, saying, Dear Charles, please find enclosed, as requested, a witness statement in respect of Higher Broughton post office. This has been produced under our, quote, without prejudice agreement, as outlined in Martin Bennett's letter to you of the 6th of February 2001. Thank you for your acceptance that Pocker will be charged on a time and materials basis for this work. And if we just skip over the page, we can see there's a witness statement. Yes. Yep, and it goes on for pages and pages. Yep. Okay? Yep. Um, going back to the first page um, at then, So we can see that the witness statement is being produced under the without prejudice agreement that's recorded in the letter of the 6th of February that we've just looked at. Yes. As part of your commercial responsibilities, were you aware that the post office had agreed to pay um, ICL on a time and materials basis? I do remember that, yes. For um, support in pursuing prosecutions? Yes. Including the provision of witness statements? Yes. And can you recall when into the process you discovered that? Um, is, who, can you see who's copied on this letter? Um, I don't think there's any copy if you scroll down. I should say that there's lots of these letters um, throughout your period in yes. office, um, providing witness statements. This is just an example where Mr. Hooper, or the author of the letter, says, here's a witness statement. I'm providing it on the basis of the without prejudice agreement in the yep. uh, letter of the 6th of February. I, I, would have, I suspect that I would have been aware of um, the fact because it's a commercial issue, we'd have to t charge the finance function was part of my function, of my responsibility, and therefore we'll be responsible for billing the post office for the time and materials. And so what was happening was that ICL was providing litigation support not pursuant to a contract because it um, argued that yes. the contract didn't require it, yes. but pursuant to a without prejudice agreement contained in a letter. Yes. Were there any similar arrangements in place for the provision of litigation support 
um, for non-criminal investigations, i.e. civil litigation? I can't um, recall whether there was a distinction. Were you aware of any formal policy within Fujitsu or any protocol between Fujitsu and the post office that carried the arrangements that we see here into effect? No. I mean, there are quite a long, lot of documentation around the contract, contract reference documents and various other d documentation, and I can't specifically remember. I mean, there are quite a lot of them. It's a long time since I've seen the list of such documentation. I didn't notice any in the bundles. We've given you copies of the codified agreements that yeah. are relevant to, to this time. And I'll, I'll look at one of those just very briefly in a moment. What I'm essentially asking is, were you aware of any policy within Fujitsu that said, we've taken on this function, these are the standards that, go, that are going to be applied um, if, if these are how those standards are going to be achieved, this is who's going to do what, and this is how they're going to do it. I couldn't, I can't um, name a document specifically that would do that. Um, would you expect there to be? I would expect there to be a document. I, my view of pathways, internal documentation and controls was that I thought it was very good. Um, it was well documented. All the processes are well documented. Um, I would expect that Graham Hooper, as security manager, there would have been security policies and audit policies that um, Pathway would have followed as a matter of course. It's not something that would be left floating so there would be specific, doc could well be a specific document. I would expect there to be a specific document within the library um, that would set out what we were going to do in this instance. And how it was going to be done and who was going to do it. Exactly. Because as you say, it can't just be left floating. No, it was, it was a common methodology that there was such, um, all, all the pro policies and procedures that followed were, I thought, in my view, um, well positioned as a controlling mechanism of how the account was run. Can we look then, we're going to look at three documents that perform a similar function um, uh, if they had been um, e either issued as um, operative guidance or um, actually carried into effect. And can we start please with Fujitsu Double zero one five two one four zero. And again, I'm going to spend a little time on this um, document as it's a new document for the inquiry um, received by us after all of the relevant witnesses in phases two and three had given their evidence. Uh, can you see? Um, the title to the document, Evidential Information, Production, Certification and Retention. Yes. So that looks quite hopeful, doesn't it, in terms of performing the function that you just spoke about. Yes. And then look at the abstract, a description of the process required to demonstrate the integrity of a pay certificate and the associated declaration. Again, that looks quite hopeful, doesn't yes. it? Yes. Yes. And... Um, if we scroll down, please, to see who it was authored by, you'll see it's status versus an initial draft. I ought to have said that the date at the top right was the 4th of August, 1998. I appreciate these are before your time, or by a, um, some margin. You'll see that it's authored by Barry Proctor, and the distribution um, includes 
um, Graham King, Matthew Cooper from Alliance and Leicester, Graham Hooper from Alliance and Leicester, uh, Pete Spence, Alan Dalvarez, Christopher Billings, Dave Campbell, ICL Outsourcing, Martin Bennett, and uh, the Library. Um, this, of course, is a few years before you took up your position, and therefore you're not mentioned um, at all. Uh, just a couple of questions. Do you recall what ICL Outsourcing was? Yes. I believe it was the procurement function for Fujitsu at the time. So procuring... Um, Third-party services. And you'll see that the, one of the um, places to which it was distributed was a library. Was that an, um, an intranet library? It was an intranet library, yes. To which um, you would have had access? Uh, I'm just pausing because I'm not sure whether the library, the library was controlled by the project office um, and by the change control functions. So it was part of the documentation set uh, that they managed. So it would have been available on request, but I'm not sure that it was simply a document, simply a, a library that one could just dial up and, and, and look at documents. How would you know whether to look for a document in a library if you didn't have access to the library? It's um, a good question. I can't remember how the library was managed. It, wasn't, it was part of the infrastructure sort of function that supported software and services. It was the change control um, light, uh, function. Okay, I'll move, I'll move on. Can we go to page four, please? Uh, we can see um, at the introduction. Uh, there's some three passages on this page that I'm going to draw your attention to that, that may suggest, uh, like your view, that this is a policy or a process document that's about benefit payment fraud prosecutions, not the prosecution of sub-postmasters for theft or false accounting. So can you see in the um, first sentence, uh, prima facie evidence to be presented for benefit payment fraud prosecutions is obtained solely from the ICL Pathway Fraud Case Management System, FCMS. This computer output is only admissible in evidence where special conditions are satisfied. These conditions are described uh, in detail in section 69 of PACE and require ICL Pathway to provide, quote, honest, uh, end quote, certification of such computer generated evidence. Would you agree that the first sentence appears to restrict the coverage provided by this document to benefit payment fraud prosecutions? Well, the topic is about benefit payment fraud prosecutions, yes. Uh, well, let's look on the scope then. Uh, this process describes the PACE certification of computer evidence originating within the ICL pathway FCMS to support benefit payment fraud prosecutions. The, the last part of that sentence again suggests that this is all about benefit payment fraud prosecutions. Would seem so, yes. And then if we just scroll down to paragraph four at the bottom, um, under certification, irrespective of the number of fraud prosecutions that the ICL pathway FCMS supports, a pay certificate must be provided for each individual prosecution. So that's probably the third um, indication, the first part of that sentence, which again suggests that this document was all about fraud prosecutions involving benefit payments. Agreed? It seems so, yes. So on the face of it, not much to do with the prosecution of sub-postmasters for um, theft by them or false accounting by them? On, on the face of it, yes. Can we now look at a later iteration of the policy, please? Um, FUJ 015-2142.
you'll see that, um, and again, this document is, um, is new to the inquiry. Um, can um, you see that the title and the abstract are the same? Yes. Um, it's moved from being an initial draft to a draft. Yes. The distrib distribution list is broadly the same, albeit Dave Campbell at ICL Outsourcing has been changed to Les um, Faraday at ICL yep. Outsourcing. Yep. And I think Patrick Catamol is um, added to the, uh, the list. You'll see top right that it's dated the 9th of December 2000, uh, 1998. 19th of December 1998. Yes. The first one was, remember, 4th of August 1998. So we're um, four or five months on. And are any of those people on that list, the distribution list there, um, post office people, to your knowledge? Not that I'm aware of. And again, we can see that it goes to the library. Now, um, can we look at two documents um, side by side, the relevant parts of them, please? Um, on the left-hand side of the page, can we have FUJ 0015-2140 at page four? Then on the right-hand side of the page, can we have the document we're on, 2142, also at page four? Thank you. So left-hand side of the page, August. Right-hand side of the page, December. Can you see, in relation to the three points that I picked up earlier, suggesting that the left-hand document was all about benefit, payment fraud, that they've gone? So in the introduction, it says prima facie evidence to be presented in support of criminal prosecutions. Yes. So the um, restriction on, or limitation of benefit payment fraud prosecutions has gone. It has, yes. And um, can you see under scope um, Whereas the last line of the first paragraph of scope um, suggested that the policy related to support benefit payment fraud prosecutions um, in the third line of scope, that's been changed to, to support criminal prosecutions. It has, yes. And then fourthly, under certification, whereas previously um, it mentioned irrespective of a number of fraud prosecutions. That's just been changed to pay certificates may be required for each individual uh, criminal prosecution. Indeed. So it looks like the, the fraud, benefit fraud, has been, has been stripped out. Yes, it does. And there's a couple of flies in the ointment to um, the suggestion that I'm making that um, there's been a stripping out of the coverage of the policy to remove the limitation on uh, benefit fraud prosecutions. If we go over on the right-hand side of the page, um, one page to page five. Um, if you look at the bottom uh, under paragraph five, in order to support, sorry, in order to demonstrate the integrity of a Horizon Pay Certificate for the benefit payment service, it's necessary to describe information, et cetera, et cetera. So that, again, seems to be focused on um, benefit payments, doesn't it? Yes. And then if you go over the page on the right-hand side again, there's a diagram. And these appeared in the, the earlier iteration in exactly the same way. Um, you'll see there's a diagram of information flow and can you see that it starts with CAPS, which was a benefits agency payment system? Yes, I can see that. So not completely clear, because there are two um, residual mentions of um, benefits agency payments, therefore suggesting that the policy might be focused on fraud prosecutions. 
Agreed? Yes. Overall, would you agree that this tends to suggest that this later iteration of the policy was broader in its coverage? It would seem it was heading that way, if, if, even if there were flies in the ointment, but this was a still a draft, wasn't it? It was still a draft. Can we see what the substance of the um, policy says? And I'm going to use um, the, the later version, the one on the right-hand side, um, to do this. So we can lose the one on the left, please. Thank you. And then um, if we can blow up underneath the diagram. The policy says, given the size and complexity of the horizon system, it is conceivable that the integrity of the PACE certificate will be challenged by counsel in order to discredit a prosecution. If it is not possible to demonstrate the certificate's integrity to the court's satisfaction, a very dangerous precedent will have been set and all subsequent prosecutions will be automatically jeopardized. However, the corollary is also true and a successful demonstration of honest certification will stand all subsequent prosecutions in good stead. And it continues in the light of those warnings to say comprehensive records um, pertaining to the sites, services and individuals concerned should be um, able to be produced at all times. Uh, these records will serve to show that the relevant services were available at all material times, were operating properly and had not been used inappropriately. So looking at those two paragraphs together, would you agree that this was suggesting that the person um, who signs the certificate must be able to produce evidence to support what they were certifying? Uh, yes. And it was said that it was... Um, Give me a moment. If we go further up to page four, please. Sorry, to page five. The policy says in the, second para uh, the first paragraph, it's therefore vitally important that whoever signs the PACE declaration on behalf of ICL Pathway can produce evidence to support these statements. Traditionally, PACE certificates are signed by a senior member of the computer operations staff responsible for managing the computer installation and its associated networks. ICL Outsourcing performs this role as a managed service for ICL Pathway, and it's assumed that the information required for their assurance is available to them in day-to-day -day operational documentation as management information. And then there's a note to Les Faraday to provide more appropriate wording. Uh, the certificate, see example at Appendix A, contains a declaration including the statement, I signed this certificate knowing that I shall be liable for prosecution if I've stated in it anything which I know to be false or do not believe to be true. It is therefore in his rational self-interest to ensure A, that the logs are adequately comprehensive and that B, that they are investigated thoroughly. Just pause a moment, there's some movement going on to my right. I just need to check out what's going on. So, it says that it is vitally important that the person who signs the certificate must be able to produce evidence to support what they're certifying. Yes? Yes. You can't just sign a certificate. You've got to be able, if you're challenged, 
um, to be able to produce secondary evidence to support what you're saying is what this policy is suggesting. It is. And then it says, traditionally, pay certificates are signed by a senior member of the computer operations staff uh, with a capital C and a capital O. Who were computer operations? I couldn't tell you. Have you any idea? Uh, possibly the service function because it relates to managing the computer installation and its associated networks. So we know in due course that people from the third tier of um, support, the SSC, um, uh, provided some witness statements and some analysts in the security department provided witness statements. Are either of those within the description of computer operation staff? Uh, potentially, um, I'm trying to, it's really where the functions sat, or where they sat across, so it's, um, so statements that were signed by, we saw Graham Hooper, and we've seen Jan Holmes, would have sat across a, a definite, not a definition, but a, a title of computer operations, I guess, within the computer operations. Um, it continues in the last paragraph there, um, having set out what the declaration um, on the witness statement says, that it's in his, um, I think that's going to be the author of the um, statement, rational self-interest to ensure that logs are adequately comprehensive and they're investigated thoroughly. Uh, would you agree that that um, is common sense? Yes. And that it contemplates the production of logs? It would suggest that logs are available. Yes, A and logs that have been investigated thoroughly. Yes. Not just produced. They've been investigated thoroughly before they are produced. In signing the certificate, yes. Would you agree that um, this um, document is a document that ought to be um, shown to or explained to anyone who produced a witness statement for Fujitsu in a criminal or civil prosecute, a, a criminal prosecution or civil proceedings? Uh, to the extent that this, the pay certificates were required, yes. And um, would you agree that its terms um, should have been complied with? Um, if it became a, f a uh, version 1.0 published document, yes. We're going to see that that never happened, that it never became a 1.0. Do you know why it wouldn't happen? What would stand in the way? Well, wasn't the Martin Bennett letter referring to the fact that pay certificates weren't required? And so do you know that that is the reason why um, I don't it never became a, a, a 1.0? I can't specifically say that, but I can assume, well, I can come to that conclusion that because pay certificates were not required, this particular policy never was never required, but it may have it may have appeared in some other form in terms of the production of witness statements. And can we go on, please, to um, page um, six? And scroll down, please. Um, where we left off, um, this secondary evidence should include, but it's not restricted to, the following. 
And then there's a series of, um, of bullet points. So this is saying that behind the certificate should be kept some comprehensive records, which is described as secondary evidence, and they should in, um, include an external auditor's certificate of data integrity. Were you ever um, aware of um, external auditors providing certificates of the integrity of Horizon data? I can't say one way or the other. Um, if they were, it may well been or arranged at a at this operational level in the production of the statements but i can't specifically recall an external auditor so it doesn't mean to say it didn't happen but you'll see certainly at th this time the policy that was being uh, proposed when the section 69 and 70 of pace were in force yeah. was that there should be an external auditor certificate of data integrity Yes. Can you recall any discussion uh, that followed the repeal of Section 69 of PACE about the continuing necessity for an external auditor's certificate of data integrity? What wasn't dealt with at a, at a commercial level, as a commercial matter. If um, there was a cost involved in that, uh, that's well, something that that's would have it, yeah, I, I, bubbled up to your level, wouldn't yeah, it? it? Well, that's the, yes. I, I'm getting to that point that I, I can't recall whether we actually paid. I mean, the level of detail, um, you know, the number of suppliers that we payments that we would have made over the years, over the time. I can't specifically recall a whether we did or whether we didn't. Um, secondly, logs of calls to the. Horizon System Help Desk and the Payment Card Helpline detailing incidents of error, inaccuracy or malfunction pertaining to the site's equipment, services or individual concerns. I'm going to skip the next um, a couple and go over the page, please. And the last bullet point, the secondary evidence should include testimony from expert witnesses stating that in their experience, similar incidents have never happened or if they had, they would be reflected in the relevant audit log. Can you recall um, when you joined whether that was something that occurred, namely ICL, when it produced any certificates or witness statements supporting a criminal prosecution, would also seek, um, as part of the secondary evidence, testimony from expert witnesses stating in their experience similar incidents had never happened or if they had, they'd be reflected in the relevant audit log. No, I can't. Can we move on, please, and look at Fujitsu 0015-2171? So this is the third in the trilogy of documents that I wanted to... Um, show you. You'll see that this is dated the 30th of January 2001. Um, it is a version 0 0.1 and therefore draft. Um, if we um, see that the title has changed um, to production of system information for evidential purposes, the abstract is uh, requirements and proce procedure for the production of evidential information to support potential prosecutions and uh, procedure for the creation of witness statements. It seems to have been written by Graham Hooper. Um, distribution, ICL Pathway Library, 
Graham Hooper, Chris Billings. So this is January 2001, just before you joined. Slightly different title and abstract to what we saw earlier. And this is a procedure document, whereas the last ones were described as process documents. Can we go, please, to page um, four? We can see in paragraph one that the mentions of PACE have been stripped out. Yes. And would you agree that this tends to suggest that this um, policy document is applicable to all um, criminal prosecutions in which ICL are involved? Yes. And uh, looking at scope, again, um, mention here of PACE and indeed of benefit for fraud prosecutions not, not included. But then under four, certification, this um, draft policy reads, traditionally PACE certificates are signed by a senior member of the computer operations staff responsible for managing, um, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll remember that from the last yes. document we looked at. Yep. The certificate, um, um, C example at Appendix A, will come back to that because, in, in fact, Appendix A does not include a sample declaration. And then it sets out the sample declaration. And then if we go over the page, please. Um, 4.2, the manager of the ICL pathway uh, fraud risk management team or his deputy will advise a nominated member of ICL outsourcing of the relevant dates and times for which a PACE certificate is required. So it is mentioning PACE in these parts. The nominee will consult operational records pertaining to computer and network operations on the dates and times advised in order to satisfy himself that a certificate can be signed with confidence. A statement should accompany the certificate to effect that additional supporting evidence to uphold the certificate can be produced. To offer all the evidence without being requested would only serve to flood the courtroom with documentation. And then supporting evidence now gets its own heading under five. There's the passage about it being conceivable that the integrity of the PACE certificate will be challenged. Uh, comprehensive records must be um, uh, uh, available to be produced as before, and they're set out, including the external auditor's certificate of data integrity. And then over the page, we'll see um, exactly the same as before. Yes. Now, you remember that it said that the PACE certificate was in Appendix A. Yes. If we go over the page, please, we can see what Appendix A is. And in fact, it's not a PACE certificate at all. It's a witness statement. Yes. A blank witness statement um, in terms of date and um, author. And if you just, um, if we just scroll through very slowly, you can see it's like a template to be written by a security analyst. And it's describing the balancing process and then later the extraction of documents. And then over the page, please. And then over the page again. There's an interesting line at the top of this um, third page. The integrity of audit data is guaranteed at all times from its origination, storage, and retrieval to subsequent dispatch to the requester. Controls have been established to provide assurances to post office internal audit that this integrity is maintained. So a draft witness statement rather than a certificate. Certainly. So would you agree that um, post the repeal of um, section 69 of PACE, uh, 
Yes, the policy appears to have, uh, the draft policy appears to have changed. And although there's some language that refers to pay certification, the draft policy is suggesting that um, everything that has been said before in the drafts obtains, but now will produce a witness statement rather than a pay certificate. It would appear so, yes. Do you know why this would um, not be carried into effect, would not ever become version 1.0? You're saying, telling me it didn't become. Correct. Um, I can't say unless there was another document, another document which dealt with production of witness statements. Uh, we haven't um, been given one. Um, you would agree, wouldn't you, that, um, and I, I think you in fact did earlier, that it would be important to have a policy that carried the contractual requirement or the without prejudice agreement into effect that told people within Fujitsu how it was going to be done. Uh, yes, I, that's what I said. Can you think of a good reason why a policy like this would not be carried into effect? I can't think of a good reason. So we're about to turn to the um, uh, Cleveley's case. I wonder whether that yep. would be a good uh, moment for lunch and perhaps come back at quarter to two. That, that's fine, Mr. Beer. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Two.